Black Men Who Care, Inc., a nonprofit community organization that serves the young and senior citizens. The issue today discussion is the plight and struggle of black people in America. Welcome to the set, Mr. Lorenzo B. Gray. Welcome, Mr. Gray. Thank you very much. I see here in your bio where you were born in uh, Philadelphia, born February the 13th, 1960, also attended a Benjamin Franklin High School for all males. Also, you attended uh, a school, OIC, in uh, Philadelphia. You also attended Thaddeus Stevens State School of Technology in Lancaster. You also attended American Trade Institute in Dallas, Texas. And you were the founder and president of Black Men Who Care, Inc. How did you come up with the name, Black Men Who Care? Well, actually, <coughs> I guess you could say a couple of ways. For one thing, I had came up with a different name one time. I was involved uh, quite uh, actively in a community protest in Dallas, Texas. And uh, anyway, I went to the guy that was leading those protests with an idea because I had been there a few months at the time. And I could tell it was a good thing, but I could tell it wasn't quite enough. So I was going to start an organization. Matter of fact, I had initially came up with the name uh, National Association for the Advancement of People. And the fella told me that wouldn't work. So I kind of left the idea of even doing an organization alone for a few more months and kept my active protesting going on. And then at that time, this was like in 91, 1991, uh, it was a lot of conversations in the media about uh, black people being uh, endangered species and this type of thing, especially the black male. So I start thinking, okay, if times are hard for people, they're harder for blacks. If they're hard for blacks, they're harder for the black man. Who's going to get the black man to be rehabilitated or fixed or whatever you like to call it? So I figure, well, if anybody's going to help the black man is going to have to be the black man. And for the black man to help the black man, he's going to have to care. That would be the incentive to get involved in helping black people, helping your black self. And it went from there, and then I uh, found out about how you uh, start nonprofit organizations and how you incorporate and all this sort of thing, and that's how it came to be, Black Men Who Care Incorporated. Okay, Mr. Gray, we also saw where your organization is dealing with uh, young youth and senior citizens. Could you uh, explain to me how you work with the youth and the senior citizens? Yes, well, as far as uh, the youth is, as a matter of fact, the youth are the primary uh, target for us, even though we do deal with senior citizens. Uh, as far as the youth, what we're really trying to do is prepare the youth for the future. As a matter of fact, that's our mission statement, is to prepare the youth for the future and help our people help themselves. Uh, preparing the youth for the future, that consists of largely educating them with the proper knowledge. You know, a parent and all adults, I believe that their uh, job for serving youth is to prepare them to be independent for their future. And so that's going to be through knowledge, through education. Uh, we have to, when I say we, I'm talking about black men. Uh, those that are part of black men who care incorporate the organization or just black men who care, period, in their heart. Uh, <coughs> we're going to have to give them examples of black men that are doing some good things, positive things, even natural common things that should be done. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're involved with an operation outreach program at the Hutchins State Jail here in uh, Dallas, Texas. It's uh, sort of like the scared straight program that they had in New York, but it's a bit different, but it's yet a good program, Operation Outreach. We do that. Uh, we go into schools quite a bit. I say if you want to help anybody, you go where they are. So where are the children? They're in the schools. That's why we go into schools. Assembly programs. Uh, 
career day events. Uh, we do outside programs. We take children annually to the uh, Black Rodeo at Fair Park, uh, postal gathering that they have every year. Uh, some of us are post employees. I'm one myself. Uh, then we like to take them to the Universal Circus, the only black circus owned and run in the world. So we love to take them to that, and that's good. And uh, mainly give them positive images, black male positive images that they can see and reach and touch and know that, yes, it's true, they do exist, that type of thing. As far as the senior citizens, uh, primarily either at a... Uh, senior citizens complex where they might live or a nursing home or something we'll pick one and we may uh, have entertainment and fruit for them monthly and we'll have people do what they do entertaining sing poetry uh, rap whatever they do and fruit and they seem to like that so that's mostly what we do we'd like to get them out too so we're going to try to do that later see if we can get some of the seniors to go to some of the activities Okay, great. Before we get deeper into the discussion, I'd like to, I guess, go into a little bit about maybe you have favorite things or favorite people you like. Maybe we'll try to discuss some of your favorites. Maybe you can tell me who your favorite actor is. Oh, wow, my favorite actor. Well, one thing... <coughs> This one actor, he's my favorite, I believe, but I can't think of his name. <laughs> he does a lot more producing these days, perhaps even directly, than he does acting. But for those that might know who he is, if you saw the movie Menace to Society, the detective that was interviewing the fella whose fingerprint was on the beer bottle that had fell in the store, bald head fella, sort of tall. But since I can't think of his name, I do like uh, Forrest Whitaker. And he reminds me like him, and I kind of like them close to the same. I think the guy name is Dukes, if I'm not mistaken. Peter Dukes? Bill Dukes? So Bill Dukes is actually my very favorite, but I, I like Forrest Whitaker as well, so I'll have to go with those two. Great. How about your favorite comedian? Oh, well, that's an easy one. <laughs> My favorite comedian is uh, Jamie Foxx from Tyler, Texas. Um, is it Tyler or Terrell? Terrell, Texas, yes. Uh, Jamie Foxx is my favorite from Terrell, Texas. Uh, if you're not from around these parts, you might not know the inside joke of Terrell. Uh, I'm from Philly, like you said. Uh, there used to be an institution called the Byberry. So people from Philly, if you know about the Byberry, that's what it's like him from being from Terrell. <laughs> Terrell Texas, or Jamie Foxx, that'd be my favorite comedian. He is pretty funny. How about your favorite singer? Uh, favorite singer? I'm going to go with Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill. Okay. Um, favorite rapper? Favorite rapper? Well, I'll say this, if you're talking about all time, live and dead, it's going to be Tupac. If you're talking about those that are still living, uh, I'll say uh, it's kind of two, and I'm sort of liking three. Uh, so Scarface and Master P, and I'm kind of liking Ja Rule, too. Yeah, those would be my favorite rappers. <laughs> Do you like to read? I love to read. I love to read. Tell me your favorite book and the last book you've read. Whew. Well, the last book I read is easy because I can remember that. I'll say that real quick because uh, my favorite when I've read so many and there's so many good ones. Uh, my last, the last book I read was uh, a book titled uh, Shakedown, Exposing the Real Jesse Jackson. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, my favorite Mm, All-time book. I'll go with one. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's uh, our, some of our black men who can't incorporate it. It's our uh, official book. We didn't write it. Uh, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Richard Wims out of New York, he wrote it. It's a book called They Stole It, But You Must Return It. I'd have to say that's my very favorite because it's pertaining to the issues of our struggle as well as some of the solutions. 
So I'd have to say they stole it, but you must return it as my favorite book. Okay. Lorenzo, I'd like to ask you, um, I'm not sure if you saw the bar, uh, the play, uh, the, the movie Barbershop, and if you did, what did you think about that particular movie? Well, as a matter of fact, I did see Barbershop. Uh, you know, it's interesting the way things turned out from when I first saw it. When I first saw it, I didn't think a lot about it. Uh, and I'm thinking you may be referring to the scenes that caused so much controversy. Uh, I was really surprised more than anything. I was surprised that <laughs> these brothers were even willing to dialogue those things because I'm wondering what's the purpose. Okay, they say it was a comedy, so that's entertainment, but that was foul entertainment. Uh, anyway, this is what's so interesting to me. From the time I first saw it to now to where my feelings and thoughts and all sorts of things have evolved. Uh, when I first saw it, I thought it wasn't right, wasn't cool. Then I started hearing more people speak to that. And as I thought about it, it seemed like that's wrong. They shouldn't have did that. And I'm thinking, where's the outcry from people that fought with Martin, that are related to Martin, Where's the outcry? Where's something from those people that signify strength? And when I thought about that, it just hit me straight. It was like, they wouldn't have said that about Elijah Muhammad, I bet you. And I believe that they wouldn't have said that about Elijah Muhammad. And I thought, well, okay, why wouldn't they have? I say for fear, for fear of repercussions, because that's something that's had me respect the Nation of Islam even more than before, like after the Million Man March, and plus I saw a lot of their works in Philadelphia growing up. But as I noticed, there was no legacy of strength remaining from uh, Martin's legacy, but from Elijah Muhammad there was, because I knew right away they wouldn't do that to Elijah because the nation probably wouldn't tolerate it like that. And so okay, let me cut in right here. When you say they wouldn't tolerate or they wouldn't put up with, they wouldn't put up with what? I, I don't, I don't, I heard you say Martin Luther King Jr., but what happened uh, in, in the movie Barbershop that some people may not have even saw the movie Barbershop, so we need to know what's going on that's leading you to think or say what you're saying. Okay, I see what's going on. <laughs> okay, obviously you know what happened, I'm thinking, because you asked me, but like you said, there's probably people watching that haven't even seen the movie Barbershop, don't even know what the controversy is. Okay, I feel you. Okay, this is what happened. Cedric the Entertainer, he played an older fella, Barber, okay? You could tell it was him, but he had old gray hair with the afro, and he just liked to clown and talk noise in the barbershop. He clowned different people, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, O.J., Rodney King, Jesse Jackson. But to me, the situation with Martin Luther King was the most disrespectful. Uh, just to say it like he said it, Cedric said Martin Luther King wasn't nothing but a hoe. And I'm like, oh, no. And uh, sure enough, that's what he said. And uh, like I said, after thinking about it, feeling about it, and then seeing and hearing about it, then it started to affect me more and more. And I'm like, no, they wouldn't have said that about Elijah Muhammad. Don't get me wrong. I don't believe either of those men was a hoe, okay? But I'm saying, where is somebody significant with strength uh, standing up for Martin uh, the way I believe that the nation would for Elijah Muhammad? That's what I'm talking about. And so... <coughs> That's helped me respect the Nation of Islam even more because it's obvious and clear that they have a legacy and aura remaining even after Elijah's passing that you won't disrespect our uh, leader like that even though he has passed uh, one of our historical figures. We won't tolerate it. You see, and a person might say, well, how do you know that? Uh, it didn't happen to them. But that's my point. That's the aura that's there that I feel strongly. And I'm certain about it. Uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan and his followers wouldn't tolerate on the level uh, over there with uh, 
the remaining organization of Mount, uh, Martin Luther King, which is the SELC. <clears throat> Even some of his children, he has two sons. Uh, I don't know if it's two or three daughters, uh, but it's just something wrong with that picture. Just to give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And I don't be running to say, okay, well, white folks this, so black folks that. I ain't with that. But see, a lot of times, it's not black and white. It's not male and female. A lot of times, it's human nature. That's what it is. But this fellow named Wayne Newton, just so happened I saw a story about his life on the History Channel. And it was a time in his career that comedians were making fun of him, trying to say he was a sissy, meaning like a faggot or something like that. Well, Johnny Carson was the late night show king. And he had been clowning uh, Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton, about six foot three. Well, anyway, he didn't appreciate it. He said he went down there to Johnny Carson's office and confronted him about these jokes he had been making about him. And Johnny Carson, like, well, you know, I love you, one of my favorite. He like, bull, you know, ain't no way and you disrespect me like that. So he told him, he said, I tell you what, uh, if I hear that again, I'll be back here to knock you on your ass. That's what he said. And he also said that Johnny Carson stopped telling those jokes too. Now, I'm not advocating violence. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying sometimes you got to stand for something on a certain level. Well, okay, you say that would be violent for him to attack him physically, but evidently, see, the thing is this, you do what you want to do, but whatever you do, there can be some consequences you have to pay. If you feel strong enough about something that you're willing to suffer, whatever the consequence, then do what you want to do. And then if the consequences come, you deal with that. Okay, Mr. Gray, I have a question for you about this particular situation. And the question that I have is, it seems that that particular statement affected you a lot. And so my question to you is, have you, as in Mr. Gray, took out any initiative to either write to the people that's producing or, you know, uh, try to find out what can you do to take a stand toward the situation that you heard that was said in the movie that affected you? Have you taken a... Uh, any initiative to do anything or write or email or any such thing as that? Well, uh, I haven't done anything as far as uh, contacting the people that did that show, produced it, wrote it, or what have you. I've been thinking more of trying to talk to people in general, which I'm talking primarily black people, but community people and just people that I run across if I could have any kind of a setting with a group of people, it would be great. But mainly, I'm, I've just thought about talking to the people about it to see how people feel about it and share my uh, view about it. But I hadn't even thought about contacting the people that did it. So maybe that's something I could do. Perhaps. All right, thanks. Lorenzo, what do you think or how do you feel about rap music and rap artists? Rap music, rap artists. I love rap music, and I love rap artists. So, that's what I feel and think about it. Uh, I'm familiar with rap uh, from as far back as the Sugar Hill Gang. Uh, that's when I first saw it, but I'm not sure if they was calling it rap at the time. Uh, then I saw a fella named Curtis Blow which was interesting, it was good. You know, I was a younger fella then, I'm 42 now. Uh, to the Hill Gang, we're talking about maybe 78, 1978, okay? <laughs> this is, what, December 27, 2002. Been a few years. Curtis Blow probably was, what, maybe around 78, 79, same year. Uh, but actually, I didn't really get if you could call it strongly into rap until after I started hearing of a group called uh, Public Enemy. And when I heard that, talking about fight the power and all this sort of thing, it's like, hey, I kind of like that. And, you know, Kumo D, I heard a couple of his. Uh, and when I finally got caught up in Tupac, which was in 1996 uh, probably, 
It's just another world for me because it's interesting because I didn't even know Tupac was a rapper. I was following Tupac as an actor. Saw him in Juice, saw him in Poetic Justice, and I was like, it's something for real about this guy, you know. Then I didn't even know he was a rapper until he got shot the first time. Then when he got shot, I'm like, I didn't even know he was a rapper. Uh, so then I got caught up into that, read a couple of interviews, bought a CD, uh, two-piece CD, uh, All Eyes on Me. I bought it on the strength of one record, I Ain't Mad At You. Next thing I know, I got emotionally involved with him because I saw some things, I read some things, I heard some things, looked like he was done dirty. And it made me think about God doesn't like ugly. That's why he survived those five bullets and he retaliated. Some other people died. It was a big mess. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's kind of like why I'm real strong on Master P. Uh, he's a rapper. Uh, one of the richest rappers, as a matter of fact, from New Orleans. He said he made country cool, being country cool, which looks like it's true. Uh, but that's one of the things I really like about Master P. By me being an aspiring actor, uh, I saw Master, Master P's first movie. It was strictly off the street. Uh, it wasn't in Blockbuster. It was on the street, uh, about it, about it. Well, then it was redone to the quality level that was in Blockbuster. I saw it then. When I saw about it, about it, I was with uh, Master P ever since that. Uh, and so, and Master P, Scarface, and Ja Rule, kind of my favorite rappers of the day. Uh, so, I'm really into it. Uh, I think rappers a lot of times are getting a bad rap because they try to make it like because they cuss, they use vulgarity and talk nasty, whatever you want to call it. They act like it's their fault that it's played on the radio. They don't have that kind of power, you see. When I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, like in 74, I'm 14, my favorite comedian was Rudy Ray Moore. And I'm talking about this boy was so raw, he made uh, Eddie Murphy uh, jokes seem like he quotes scriptures. But you never heard Rudy Ray Moore on the radio. That's my point. These rappers do not have the power to let this stuff be played on the radio. But yet they're the ones that's being targeted for letting all this profanity being heard by young people. I'm like, look what they're doing. They letting these youngsters make a little bit of money. The people behind them make all the money. Then they let them catch all the flack from the things they're saying where they don't have the power to be letting that be played on radio. It wasn't allowed when I was 15 and 16, even the TV. They didn't have cuss words on the TV when we was growing up. They do now, bare butts and everything. The B word, maybe even the F word these days. So who is that? There's something going on. So, Lorenzo, what do you think that we could do since, you know, uh, you're concerned about the youth um, and th the lyrics that's in the rap music, it does somewhat, my opinion, affect the thinking of the youth and you having to deal with the youth. What do you think we can do or you could do through your organization to help in that area? Well, uh, I'm going to say this first of all on the first part of that. Okay, you're telling me even though they don't control it being on the air, still uh, it's getting to these youngsters anyway. Well, actually... From what I understand, rap is primarily things being said by these rappers that's going on in our society. So by the time these youngsters hear it from the rappers, they've either already lived it, already saw it, already experienced it, you see. So these lyrics are not coming out of the clear blue sky, you see. So it may be a youngster or two that for the first time hearing this type of situation is through rap, but I'm certain that that's probably not a common thing. These are things that's going on in our society. That's why they're able to rap about it. And so, therefore, I don't think that the rap furs are hurting so many youth through their stuff because that's just coming from what's going on. And once again, the youngsters have probably already seen it, experienced it, or lived it by the time they heard it from a rapper. Okay, let me ask you this question. Uh, do you ever communicate with the, with the youth that you come in contact with 
about the rights and the wrongs of the lyrics that they hear from the rappers? Do you discuss that with them? Well, actually, we've never had a discussion on rappers per se. Uh, but actually, I rap a little bit myself sometime. And uh, <clears throat> back in 1987, it was this, this uh, I was 27 then. It was this movie called Crush Groove uh, with Run DMC and Jam Master J and uh, Run's big brother, Russell Simmons, the guy with Fat Farm and all that stuff. Uh, and I was watching this movie, and they had a scene where they was doing some rap, and I actually learned how to rap from watching that movie. And the next year, in 1988, I wrote a rap song called Drug Problems, which that was 88. It was current then, this 2002, and it's still current now, and I've been rapping that to young people. But I've never really talked to young people about the things that rappers are saying and they shouldn't say. I have talked to them about watching rated R movies. I've done that. But I've never really targeted discussion about rappers and what they rap about. I've talked a little bit about the videos that they see, you know, on TV and that type of thing and how I know it's affecting them because it affects me. So I know it's affecting them but not exactly on what you asked me about uh, pertaining to just the rapper. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's important? Because some of the lyrics are talking about women, calling them uh, names, disrespecting them. So, and my thoughts and in my mind, I would think that uh, uh, with the way that you're going to deal with the youth and helping them to be able to realize some things, I would think that you would um, at least discuss the lyrics with them. How do you feel about that? Well, that's interesting you asked me that because right as you were wrapping that up, I'm thinking that, well, okay, I will do that <laughs> in the future. Have a discussion about the lyrics. But like I say, I had never done it like that, but I've talked about that type of thing pertaining to so many other aspects of just general life that it's not like I haven't talked about it just haven't talked about it coming from the rappers. Because I've talked about how you need to talk and not use profanity and proper grammar and all this sort of thing. Just hadn't linked it to the rappers, but from your pressing on and saying what you're saying about it, I think I need to do that, and I will be doing that in the near future. Okay, thanks. I, I, I wanted to say a little bit more, and of course I would. I, I am going to say it. Uh, and the reason I'm going to say it, because I think it's important, because... Uh, a lot of the youth are dealing and rap more than they're dealing with any other thing. So it's important that you would target that part that will help them to grow and grow of their lives, realizing that this is the not, excuse me, this is the not, this is not the way that we want to live or even think of our women, our sisters, our mothers, or our aunts, our uncles, and, and the name calling and different things like that. So I appreciate uh, you being open enough to uh, accept that from me and then beginning to communicate with them on that particular situation. So, Right, but I, I can and will say this. <clears throat> I had made attempts to uh, convince some of the rappers themselves to have uh, perhaps a rated P PG version. Matter of fact, I wrote a, a letter to Death Row Records before Tupac was killed uh, about the uh, CD, All Eyes on Me. And that's what I had mentioned to them at, on a request level, telling them that I deal with you. And one thing about their music, it has a lot of good beats, and that's what I like about the music. And I said, but some of this stuff is so raw that you can't play this for the general public. And surely we couldn't play it for children. So I had even made a request uh, to Tupac through Death Row Records before he was killed, asking could he possibly make a rated PG version. So I'll ask that to every rapper then. Uh, can you perhaps do that? You make your hardcore version, but can you make a rated PG version that can be for the youth like that? And so I've been where you are, but I just hadn't done it at the children. I actually did try to go to the rappers themselves, and I did write uh, to Death Row Records and, and asked about that. I never got a, a response, but I did make that attempt on that level. Okay, great. Great. What about the American experience?
experience for black people. What do you think about the American experience for black people? <laughs> the American experience for black people uh, has been, you could call it a nightmare. You could call it pure hell. Uh, it has been an experience that probably different things could be said about it. Uh, one thing that just popped in my mind, it's been an experience for us that shows us what we were made of. Because <laughs> in order to survive what we went through and chattel slavery in America, which is basically the root of our existence here in this country, uh, to be able to survive that, just like the fella, uh, Dr. Richard Williams said in the book, uh, They Stole But You Must Return It. He said for us to survive that and come out of it with any resemblance of sanity is a miracle in itself. And so I believe that. And so uh, that's something that did. It showed black people what they made of. And uh, we made out of something because we didn't only deal with it, we it survived it, we came through it, we rose, we did some everything, uh, even though that's the same situation that have us largely in the devastated state that we're in collectively as a people. We survived it with some resemblance of sanity, but unfortunately, mostly, it's primarily a resemblance of sanity because if we were totally sane uh, collectively as a people, we would be united as a people. You see, because that's a natural thing. Uh, Self-preservation is the number one law of nature. But if you notice, everyone seems to have a significant level of unity except black people. And if you look at our history of experience here, we should be the most united. You see, there again, that shows you what we're suffering from, uh, some of the residual effects of slavery that we're still dealing with. And so, uh, to just wrap it up and say it, uh, the Amer black experience in America has uh, been one that has been, uh, to say the least, quite challenging. Uh, and it has shown that we are durable, and it has been a pure hell and still is. What do you feel about Malcolm X? <coughs> <laughs> what do I feel about Malcolm X? Mm. Well, first of all, I kind of think about Malcolm X and it makes me think of the original Black Panther Party because I feel like he was that thing that sparked in Huey P. Newton's and Bobby Seale's spirit to stand up for yourself and your people, because that's what Malcolm always talked about. And they may have even mentioned some things about Malcolm that did inspire them. That's one of the things uh, I think about when I think about Malcolm X. Another thing I think about, because I think about a black man that loves black people too, when I think of Malcolm X, but something special that I get to think about uh, as far as Malcolm X. Okay. Malcolm X was killed in 1965. I was five at the time. By the time I started finding out about Malcolm X and knowing about Malcolm X, I was an adult, which means Malcolm had been dead already. It was at this point that I had come to love Malcolm, okay? Now, since I had just come to love Malcolm after Malcolm was already dead, I couldn't say that I loved Malcolm in past tense back when he was living because I didn't know him then. But because I came to love him after being grown, I can say I love Malcolm. Out of the experience of coming to love Malcolm after he was already dead and gone, I came to realize that I can still love my loved ones even though they're already gone through the experience of loving Malcolm after he's already gone. So my father died in December uh, 1972, December 26th. That's about 30 years ago now. And through that experience with Malcolm, I come to realize that when you lose your loved ones, you don't have to say, I love them. In past tense, you can yet say, I love them, just like they're still here, even though they're gone. And so that's the things that I think about when I think about Malcolm, because that was real special. 
and it just came to me one day. Great. What do you think about the comment Malcolm X made about the house slave and the field slave? Hmm. What do I think about it? Okay. Okay, what I think about it is, I think Malcolm meant well and had good intentions when he said that, trying to articulate the basic two different types of black people that there are. The black that will sell us out and the black that won't, basically. But I think, unfortunately, what has happened is white people that will be racist have taken that situation and painted it in a picture that really says in modern times that if you're black and financially successful, then you can't be trusted. You're the one that loves the master. But if you're the black that has little or no money, then you're that black that can be trusted, that you'll fight the white man. You would never sell them out. But see, I just happen to know that's not true because I happen to know that during the time that slavery was actually going on and you had men organizing and planning to revolt, there were slaves right from the field that went and told, you see. So that wasn't no house slave that revealed the plan out in the field. So it's like that comment signified that none of those house slaves could be trusted. Well, that wasn't true either. It was many times that that house slave would give information to those field slaves, maybe even some of the better food or whatever. A perfect example, Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom, that that term come from, the guy Uncle Tom, he wasn't really an Uncle Tom. He was perpetrating, if though he was an Uncle Tom, to slip help to different black people as he could when the white folks weren't looking, you see. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot that... Some of us don't know. So a lot of us don't care about the proper thing. But there again, a lot of it is due to the uh, residual effects of slavery. And I was talking to a lady the other day about that. And then she said, well, there were times in the, like she said, 40s and 50s where black people took, like men took care of their children more and this type of thing. She says when they brought that welfare thing in that said, if there's a man there, you can't get this check. So you get rid of him and we'll give you the money. And she says she think it went back at that point, and maybe it's true, I don't know, but I still believe that many of our ills today uh, is stemming from uh, residual effects of chattel slavery that we went through here in America. I believe that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gray. This concludes the first half of, of the talk with uh, Mr. Lorenzo Gray. We will be back with the second half shortly. Thank you. Welcome back to the second half of Issues with Lady Janice and her guest, Mr. Lorenzo B. Gray. Welcome back. Mr. Lorenzo Gray, what about black people and religion? What do you think of black people and religion? Hmm, as you already know, I'm sure that that's a very, very sensitive topic, period. And I think perhaps even more so when you talk about black people. <sighs> I think black people, and I always, uh, I talk to a lot of children, and when I talk to them, I tell them, I kick it live and keep it real. Uh, what I mean by that, kick it live is giving you information that you can use. Keeping it real is giving the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Uh, I really thank black people and religion that uh, black people have been victimized quite a bit by religion. A uh, perfect example. Frederick Douglass said that out of all the slave owners that he had, the worst ones were the ones with religion. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan say that they're Christian. Uh, it was Europeans that did the manifest destiny uh, here in America that it was about saving these native savages from themselves and they said we we're going to have to kill them from sea to shining sea uh, in the name of God. So 
When you ask me about black people and religion, it makes me think of a lot of things, but also it makes me think that that's one of the things that helped black people to come through so many of the trials and tribulations that we've been through, including chattel slavery. So when you talk religion and you talk black people simultaneously, you're talking about something serious and sensitive. And I think that uh, black people are the most godly people in the world by nature. I believe that. And actually, it's probably a good thing that black people are so godly and perhaps religious. Personally, I really don't embrace religion in that way. I say that my religious preference is what I call undistorted Christianity. I believe in that but I don't consider myself a Christian because I believe in order to be a Christian, you have to do more than just believe, which is what I do, but that's not what I practice. So I call myself a humanitarian. Uh, I even have a feeling if more of these uh, people with religions were humanitarians, then uh, things might be a bit different. Uh, there's millions and millions of religious people, Christians, Muslims, Jewish people, Buddha, Hindu, whatever, and there sure is a lot of strife going on with all these religious people. I just can't help but wonder how much different would it be if these millions of religious people were humanitarian. What do you say about black and politics? <laughs> well, black people in politics here in America, uh, black people uh, are constantly misguided and misled in the area of politics, even largely so by our own black people. Uh, what I'm referring to is this long-running commitment and loyalty of black people to the Democratic Party, the Democrats. Uh, that's not even the way politics is done, through my observation. Uh, so many of my life experiences are unique. Even my situation when it comes to voting and this type of thing uh, stems from when I finished high school. I finished high school at 17 years old. I applied for a grant. They sent me the response. It was a BEOG grant, Basic Education Opportunity Grant, when I first finished high school. I received the reply. They said I was denied, and they said the reason was, was that I wasn't registered to vote, but here I am, 17, not old enough. So what did I do as soon as I turned 18? I registered to vote. I reapplied for the application. I got the grant. I went to school. But what did I tell myself? See, sometimes we'll do things to spite someone else. And I think I called a friend of mine uh, in Michigan after that, uh, <laughs> just to say it because it just happened to be, a white friend. I had this one white friend from Michigan, used to be down here in Texas. He's like 20 years older than me. I called his house, his wife answered. She told me what was going on on TV. Okay, I haven't talked to him since, or her. Uh, my thing is, I decided I wasn't gonna turn the TV on. I'm gonna watch and wait and see how everybody else is acting, because I had kind of got the word that they thought it might be terrorism, that a, I think at this point another plane had crashed. I'm like, I'm not turning the TV on because I'm gonna just see how people are acting. I didn't watch TV until about 7.30 that evening, and they were still showing, you know, the situation going on. Uh, see, I know a whole lot about that TV, the history of TV in this country. I'm talking about where they manipulate things to do things, to think things, and so I just didn't wanna be a part of it. When I saw all the hype surrounding what was going on, I'm like, no, I'm not turning the TV on. I'm gonna see how the people act and go that route. And they acted all day long. And don't get me wrong, that's a sad situation. People were killed. Uh, I'm sure innocent people, uh, probably some children, some women. But it looked like to me that America is trying to play on that in such a way that is more to further whatever their agenda is rather than really being concerned and caring about the victims in that building. So I kind of got a problem with that, you know, when you'll take advantage of any moment 
to further your agenda, no matter how uh, devastating it may be. And, and I got a lot of issues going on with that. Uh, they're quite sensitive, some of them. Uh, I know people of all colors uh, feel bad about that situation. Um, but when they keep throwing this patriotic thing in there, that's what keeps getting me. Because, see, they're manipulating a situation that is not about patriotism, you see. And uh, they're kind of getting on my nerves. I'm just telling it like it is because I'm like, don't get me wrong, it's black patriotic people. I understand that. In America, it belongs to everybody that is citizens here, which is all colors. But it's like, see, I'm the type of person I know about a lot of things that's going on in this society that they're doing. I'm talking powers that be to the detriment of blacks collectively as a people. So it's like, I can't just jump on your patriotic bandwagon just because of an event that went down from some foreign people when yesterday, the day, and tomorrow, you still kicking me and my people in the butt, you see. Uh, black political prisoners from the 60s and 70s still locked up. Just so happened, Geronimo Pratt got out about five years ago because, what, Johnny Cochran worked on his case for about 25 years. Okay, not many of them had Johnny Cochran for 25 years. Geronimo Pratt got out. It's some black political prisoners that didn't get out, still locked up today. I got a problem with that. Uh, it just make you wonder. And so, I know America is guilty of a lot of things that a lot of citizens don't want to believe, even the things that America have confessed to. Uh, and I know that some of the things that uh, America show us that happened to them, that they have done some things to other people that they have never shown us, but I'm sure that those people over there show their people all the time. You see, the same way we were bombarded with this September 11th stuff. I think it was on TV every day from year to year. Now, that's too much. Why? It's a political agenda, and that's not right in my mind to use something so serious and devastating to further a political agenda. I don't think it's right. Thank you for your answer. Lorenzo, what do you see as black people's primary problem as, as a whole? What's the solution to the problem, and how do, you, how do we achieve the solution? Hmm. Okay, I say this. The primary problem that black people have in America, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, we know that in a nutshell is lack of unity. But let's talk about some elements pertaining to that lack of unity. Uh, I think the primary thing that's hurting black people the most is black people that are in powers of position and authority, be it business, politics, this type of thing, I think largely politics. Uh, the biggest thing that's hurting us is people that are black in those positions that are bought and paid for. Okay, those are sellouts. We have many. Uh, and I think secondly was uh, our primary problem is black people in position of power and authority that are fearful to show love for their own people, thinking that it's going to hinder their own status and position. Uh, that's unfortunate. But I do believe that's the primary problem uh, with black people's plight and struggle in America is the blacks in position of power authority that are bought and paid for and those that are afraid to show love for their own. That's primarily our problem. Now, racism is still one of our problems. It's still going on. It's just that these black sellouts and these blacks that fear to show love for their own are hurting us even more than racism. But racism is still kicking us in the butt, too. Okay, so that's another thing that's going on. And so what that ends up doing is keeping us divided because the white racist people in America, they are constantly working on things to keep us divided, you know, planting seeds of division, using our own people to help further this type of agenda, even when, like I told you, uh, Jesse Jackson Jr., John Lewis, and Mary Ellen Hicks said, vote straight Democrat. Uh, that's not the way you play politics. It just so happened I'm a registered Republican. I did that in 1997. I believe, and for the sole purpose to promote black political balance. That was my intention. I don't vote a straight ticket. I vote primarily according to who's in the race and how I feel about the individuals. I'll give you a perfect example. 
uh, Ryan Kirk, former mayor of Dallas, first black mayor of Dallas ever, was able to run for the U.S. Senator uh, as a Democrat against the Republican, John Corning. And initially, I was going to vote for Ron Kirk on the merit of his black self, coming out of his mama as a brother. And I hadn't seen any sign of him uh, actually being a sellout, okay? But when I found out that he said that he personally does not support reparations, there's no way I can vote for a black person that is not for reparations for black people. So when I not only found that out, I dug, I contacted his website, and I got confirmation that it was true that he said it, because I saw it in the Dallas Weekly, one of the weekly black papers here in Dallas. And once I got confirmation that it was true, then I said, oh, no, I can't vote for him. For then I voted along party lines at that time, when I knew I couldn't vote for him because he's a black man that does not support reparations for black people. There's no way I could ever vote for a black person like that. And so, uh, I think that uh, that's our biggest problem, but I believe that uh, obviously the answer, the solution is unity. Uh, and in order to achieve that, all I can think of is that those that are conscious enough to know that's what we are lacking and what we need to do about it, whatever we can. I think I have mentioned one time before, I heard a couple of black people say this, and these were black people that live fairly well. And we were talking about black people and what do you do to get them, you know, together and this sort of thing. And they both said this, that black people ain't going to do nothing unless you give them something. And in my mind, I'm thinking, is that true? I'm like, well, if that's true, well, let's give them something. If that's the answer, well, let's do it. <laughs> that's what I thought. It's like they were complaining about it, but I'm like, well, if that's the right answer, well, let's give them something. And so... I like to give, and so what I primarily do is give knowledge, information, and direction, and largely and primarily to our children. That's what I believe. We have to do it with the children primarily, even though we do need to do some things with some of these parents uh, and just some grown people in general. But I think uh, the key is uh, giving uh, black people something, the something that they really need, which I believe is uh, the proper knowledge, the proper education and let them see uh, blacks that are successful firsthand, close enough to touch, you know, not always bodyguards every time you see them because you have this much money and all this sort of thing. Uh, it's real interesting, but and like I said, I do believe we will come together. We will stop being a giant that's asleep, and we will wake up. We will unite. We will utilize the resources that we have so that we can be self-sufficient because we do have enough money talent, numbers, intelligence. We have enough of it all. The only thing we don't have enough of is unity. And that's our biggest, biggest problem. But I know we'll handle that. Well, thank you, Mr. Gray. I'm going to say that you have said some things pertaining to the plight and struggle of black people that I didn't quite um, think about myself. But you brought out some interesting points. And I really do uh, appreciate you being on the show, on the set today. Thanks, Mr. Gray, for being on the set. In closing, I'd like to say to the viewers and listeners, stand for something, confront the issue. And remember, if you don't stand for something, you're bound to fall. Until the next issue discussion, be blessed. Uh, and we are who we are. Now we really seek uh, to express that. Uh, you, young man, you come here. You're a Negro. No. I am your teacher. You are a Negro. No. Suppose I threatened to beat you, what would you say? Aren't you a Negro now? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Suppose I had some money in my pocket. Suppose I gave you a dollar to say that you are an American Negro. This is money now. Money talks. Money talks. This dollar. And if you don't say it, you don't get it. You're an American Negro, aren't you? No. You won't have any money. You know you need money, don't you? Yes. You need money to live, don't you? Yes. All right. All you have to say, Leon, is that you're an American Negro. Aren't you an American Negro? Are you an American?
Puerto Negro? No. What are you? A black and beautiful. What's your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Very good, man. Keep it up. Go sit down. You had to think about that a minute, didn't you? Yeah.